You're listening to The Valley Current. Why do you think these big franchise gyms like 24-Hour Fitness, there's a bunch of them, yeah. why don't they just bake in uh, someone like you, maybe ideally even you, as kind of part of the subscription? Like, why aren't they doing a much more advanced view as opposed to just being a landlord saying, you can use our real estate, you can use our equipment. Why aren't they baking in a lot more coaching uh, expert services into the delivery model just to make it, hey, when you come to us, you're getting the full soup to nuts treatment. I don't understand why they don't do that. Is it just because it's a too expensive and it changes the financial model too much? That's a very, very good question because I've heard reports that, you know, a lot of these gyms don't even expect people to come to the gym, the paying members, right? And they, that's baked into their financial models that as long as these people buy on January, it's not even in the gym's best interest for people to be transformed. <laughs> ah, you're, you're saying it's kind of just a kind of a way for someone to feel like they're doing something after right. the holidays, the November, December, gain 20 pounds. Okay, now I'm going to go to the gym, get a gym subscription, pay up for a year, but then maybe that last, maybe through Valentine's Day or something like that, right? We got him for the 12 month plan. Right. Why do I care if he quit in February? Same to my pockets. Right. It's a little bit like we 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 soothed your soul, and we took your money, and we're taking your money off of your account on a monthly basis. But we'd rather prefer that you don't show up because right. we don't want it to be as crowded and we of can course. get better numbers for a business to be thinking that way. But maybe you're right. Maybe that's the reality of, of how that business operates. But yeah, I think when we look at the the intentions and the drivers of the business, it, it makes sense, unfortunately, right? Like a gym that's that crowded all the time, January through December, I probably wouldn't go to that gym, right? Right. <laughs> as a as a fitness coach myself, I'd want to go to a less empty gym. But then the gyms don't want to have no members. They right. they have to stay in business. So there there has to be a new way to see the gym. And I think when you're talking about why don't gyms partner up with coaches, I think that's exactly the psychology that I think we're going to see in the next five years. Why don't high level dating matchmaker services throw a body trend? That's a better question that I'm curious about. You know, for the people that are a little older that are trying to find love at 35, 40, if they're paying $10,000 to find a match, why don't those companies throw in a transformation coach into it? Yeah, they get right? a little they get a little worried that they can't overpromise um we're going to transform you although I do think there there are some very high level matchmakers that completely change the wardrobe of the applicant on each side male female whatever the combination is. Right. They they look at it and say, "Well, one of the problems that you have is you're showing up uh, with the wrong style of clothes on you're you're dressing incorrectly for what you're after so they are sort of somewhat in that business but to actually go to the next level of hey we're gonna ma match you up with a a professional coach who's gonna help you lose the 20 pounds and reduce the BMI and get your body into a much better state um that that you're right i mean it's it's really part of the process of helping that person with every ounce of what they can be to create a better human potential out of their entire life i mean i think that's absolutely right. true yeah. so when you look at where where this goes are you going to stay in the virtual model or will you eventually imagine when this pandemic truly ends and we don't have some variant and people aren't wearing or thinking yeah. about wearing masks. Do you think you go into a more physical approach where you meet people in, in a physical gym or do you think that's not likely to happen? Well, I think for one, I think this whole online idea is very beneficial for the clients. I think for the people I work with, time is just another excuse. So to take that away and say, you can just call me is right. helpful. But right. 
always a passion project of mine and a question I've always wondered why it hasn't been solved yet is you have these classes like CrossFit, Orange Theory that are all group-based fitness classes. Why is there no group weightlifting class that's a community-based class where someone that says, I don't want to have an injury, but I want to know that when I'm working my chest, I really feel the contraction. I really know what's causing an injury. How do I prevent it so that I don't am not out of commission for six months? And how do I how do I learn the fundamentals early so I can have a longevity? And, and I also have a bunch of friends I make. Why don't we apply the same model fitness? That has been a goal of mine for years. So to hold a gym, to even at the very least, create that class at someone else's gym is the very next thing I'm going to do in person. Have a coach working at each station that's specialized in that area that, you know, you and your classmates are working there for 20 minutes at a time. You get personalized coaching. It's more affordable than a personal trainer. So it's like a membership based and you get the results. I think that's. So, so would it be like eight people or four people or what, what would the group be like? Because at some point it's just too big of a group, right? You right. And I don't people. And I don't imagine it's one coach running it for everyone. I'm imagining like, hey guys, welcome to L 24 hour fitness or right. Equinox. It doesn't matter. And you know, you book a time on the class and it's like 25 people. And we've technically we've rented the gym out or these these specific machines in the gym for an hour. And so during that hour, let's say and for the a certain day you're doing chest and triceps. That's what we're lifting right. right for chest. There's probably three different machines, uh, three different exercises and then triceps. There's three different exercises. And then there'll be a coach or uh, a guidance person at each one of those stations. And then we're going round Robin circling. So a group will work out at one, then the next one. And the coach will just be instructing for that exercise. Here's the right form. I notice you're doing something wrong. And when the timer's up, we move on to the next, everyone shifts. So why do you think that hasn't happened? That's a harder question to answer. I'm clear on why gyms don't have the best interest on um, having coaches, but, but group classes, I think maybe there's some logistics when it comes to finding the equipment, which is in highest demand and having a group class for that because the because the classes are in their own rooms right so you only use the equipment for those classes maybe there's a bit of a challenge that comes when you're using high demand equipment in the yeah. middle of the gym yeah i mean i remember in high school and this really goes way back uh we have what were called pe classes yeah physical education physical education yeah and i still remember you know the guy's name uh the coach's name you know sujeki he was a sort of a polish guy and you know he was a little short kind of almost a little overweight but clearly a very energetic guy and you know his view was very much cardio and his view was we're going to run around the track now for like 20, 20, right. 30 minutes. Then we're going to do a bunch of sit-ups. Then we're going to do a bunch of push-ups. It was very army military like training. And I back in my mind, I want to say it was like three days a week. And it was maybe a total of about an hour, maybe an hour and a half by the time you get out of the shower kind of thing. But it was part of, you know, this is in the Kennedy era. You weren't born yet, but this yeah. is like 1960s. It's yeah. very much, hey, a healthy mind and a healthy body and that's what we want all americans to be and that was the way it was run and it was very popular and you know there were some people that didn't like you know doing the 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 cardio there were some people that didn't like doing the push-ups but it was forced and you had to be accountable and he would yell and he would <laughs> scream i mean he was, but that's not your style your your style is more to listen and to interact is the sense i get right you're not a yeah, drill yes, but that's the school system, right? It's right. just like another class. I think my PE classes were the same. It was running based. It was a class with a cookie cutter program, one size fits all, and we're moving around. And I think it works better for kids that have so much energy, but it's hard to ask someone that's sedentary all day to start running again. You know, it's like, what's funny is, and this is 
an example like if you tell someone to do the thing they have to do at day one they're gonna quit but one of my clients he loved fast food he loved it and i was very clear there's no way i'm gonna take this away from this dude if i'm gonna expect him to succeed right so i did i i made sure we fit in fast food and he was able to eat and we found a certain type of meal he could get at fast food it's a chick-fil-a grilled sandwich grilled nuggets on the side and a diet coke that he could get two grilled chicken sandwiches and that was like 900 calories he okay. was able to eat that three times a day and the first with the 60, with the bread with the bun with the bread whole, and whole the bun thing. and everything okay. yeah okay because you could probably take out 300 calories by getting rid of the bun right you're right but i was very clear that the experience of fast food mattered to him he didn't okay. want to compromise he wanted the the burger he wanted the drink right. and the side it was like right. that combo okay and so i figured a way for him to do that and he did that he ate it three times a day and he lost 20 pounds in the first 16 days we worked wow together. that's a really good example because most people would be like no fast way food fast food really with the bread and he, and he told himself that and so but here's the best part that's not even the best part so I stayed on track and I made sure that he he felt supported when he wanted to go to different fast food places and I helped him choose the right options when he went to a different one. And then about a month into the program, he's losing all the weight. He calls me, we have our daily call and he says, hey, Iman, you know, I'm not getting as much bang for my buck when it comes to fast food. I'm, I'm not as full as I'd like to be. And I'm like, and I'm starting to be like, okay, so what are you thinking? He's like, you know, I'm thinking maybe I meal prep and I start to make fast food tasting foods at my house and I'll make it in a way where I control the ingredients so I could make it more filling for less calories because I'm in okay. control. Okay. And I was like, that's great. And I asked him, I said, if I asked you to meal prep on day one, what would you have told me? He said, no way. Right. right. No, over my dead body. Right. And I think that was the best win for me as a coach that he had to make the decision. Right. And it just took a month, but eventually he made the right decision. So you really oh. you really become kind of a psychiatrist in part where you're really helping people with whatever their journey is in figuring out sort of the steps to take to get to the next step without kind of pushing them. Right. Uh, you know, without kind of yelling, not without doing what what the PE coach in my right. high school did which is yell and scream and i'm going to get you dismissed from this class you're going <laughs> to fail it you know like yeah oh, oh what they did i should tell you this it's funny because it brings up a memory they said if you didn't take the pe class and show up you couldn't get the driver's ed class which meant you couldn't get your early license that was a big deal back oh in that's the a big deal that works they tied it together they said yeah. PE is a required class Right. I mean, you could flunk everything else and they'd still let you take the driver's ed. But the PE right. class, you had to do that or you couldn't get into the driver's ed uh, seminar or classes that allowed you to get the certificate that then allowed you to get the permits that allowed you to get the early license. So right. a lot of people back in the 60s, now today, people are like Uber, I don't need a car. Who wants a car? I just use an Uber. I got an app. I mean, you know. Right. Most young adults are not really that interested the way we were back in the 60s, way we were, meaning my generation, yeah. that, hey, you got to get a car. A car represents freedom, which means, of course, you know, you got to get a license, which means, yes. of course, you got to take the driver's ed class. So they tied it all together, which That's was smart. so smart, so smart. But you don't do anything like that, do you? Do you, do you don't try to, like, create those sort of forcing mechanisms to sort oh, of no, I do it? Do you? Do you do it? 100%. So part of the asking the right questions is finding out the things they like. So the forcing mechanism was if you track, I'll let you eat fast food every single day <laughs> as long as you do these few things. And those are the few things that, that we found out. Eat in a calorie deficit, which came down to tracking your calories. So here's the deal I'm going to make with you. If you want to eat fast food every day, all I ask is you track it. You log it in an app, and I can see those metrics every day. So when I jump on a call, I know if you went over so that we can diagnose why did you go over. And if you stayed inside it, I got no problems. 
<laughs> okay, so said, this, yeah. this is like a this is like a common access to a Noom a Noom like app, or is it something you actually have programmed? Because I suppose you could have your own apps too. There right? there so are technologies out there. It's not Noom, but it's similar. There, okay. There's a dashboard that, with certain technologies, lets me see into what they're doing. The okay, um, so yeah. so so they're logging into a system that you provide. Mm -hmm. That then gives you a, a dashboard across all your clients and you can kind of see what's going on in the yes. data yes. and you can sort of say, Hey, this person, I imagine November has got to be like the worst month, right? In terms of Thanksgiving and number of calories, you must see that across. Oh, I have such a great, I have such a great video. I got to show you at some point. Wait, maybe I could find it yeah, now. Do it, do it, find it. And, Let me and find it. Oh, this is going to be great. Oh, I'm, I'm excited to show you this. Okay. So let me, could you give me access to share my screen? Yeah, yeah, you got it. It's yours. Oh, it's mine? Okay. It's your work. So actually great timing because the person I'm showing you here is the very person that loved fast food. Okay. Okay. His name's Aaron. Mm -hmm. Awesome dude. And this is a video that we had the morning after Thanksgiving, the next day. Okay. And I'm having my call with him. Tell me if you can hear it. Okay. This was your first Thanksgiving with the new mentality. I wanted to enjoy it. I said yesterday I ate close to 3,000, 3,500 calories, if not more. 3,500 calories? That's terrible. <laughs> Wait, not so fast. You taught me about, you know, counteract when I overeat or undereat. What I can do the following day, I can add that extra calorie in to balance everything out. So what I did the day before, I ended up only eating like 1,700 calories. So even though you overate in Thanksgiving, you underate the day before, and it was just like every other day of your weight loss journey. You technically are still losing fat on Thanksgiving week. Yes, sir. Let's get it. Let's get it. Man. That's amazing, bro. So you you must support. Uh, people that are doing some degree of fasting as well, because that sort of dovetails into this. He kind of did a partial fast the day before. Now, maybe he should have done a successive. I, and I know some people, including Dr. Peter Atilia, who's really someone that you, I'll send you some of his subscription yeah. stuff because it's right on point. He's a big believer in this idea that once a year, you should do a 72, if not a 96 hour fast, just water, nothing else, literally, because wow. that resets everything once or twice a year. He's a big believer in that. He did a film with the guy who plays Thor, uh, this guy Hemsworth. Yeah. He's Hemsworth, a Chris. Guy, Chris yeah. Hemsworth from, from Australia. Yeah. It, you know, it's a great, I'll send you a link to it. It's a great show. It was done by National Geographic with them. And it's the journey of Hemsworth trying to figure out how he could get better over time, which is amazing because the guy looks perfect. I mean, the guy is like this yeah. muscle man, but uh, Peter Thor. helps him. And one of the things they do is this 96 hour fast. Wow. And, and, you know, to me, it's an interesting model because uh, there is an argument. I think that the body is doing too much work to get through all those calories like right. the machinery of the body has to overwork particularly on thanksgiving i mean yeah. it must just be for all of the united states yeah maybe the rest of the world it must be it must be amazing what all of those bodies have to go through to kind of get through all those calories and get those calories through the system. I mean, it's just like a gorging fu function that happens. In and the sewage system equally working just as hard. <laughs> right. And, and, you know, people sort of relish, I mean, of all the holidays, I think many people will put Thanksgiving at the top. I've said, yeah. if someone may be the president of the United States, the first thing I would do would say, we're going to have four Thanksgivings a year. Wow. We're Once a quarter, quarter huh? Quarterly, quarterly Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving, quarterly Thanksgivings. We're going to make I it agree. a day off. We're going to really relish the idea of being with friends and family to have one, yeah. you know, each, each season tie it yes. to a quarter. I definitely would make it right after taxpayer day, like right after April 15, like April 16 would be wow. the day that you get your, your spring quarter kind of Thanksgiving in. And you know, my vote. is we should be, we should be celebrating, uh, 
all the benefits of life. But the problem yeah. is we would have even more obesity in America if right. we had four Thanksgivings a year because people really 3,500 calories. That sounds like a double day, right? Although his average it was could be, like but you know what, what's so interesting is even if you have an extreme day, one day will not knock you off. You know, humans have a tendency to, without them even knowing it, they end up finding a maintenance, right? They end up on average eating around the same amount of food every day. You might undereat one day, you might overeat one day, but even if you were to eat three times as much as you normally eat on Thanksgiving, when you look at the next 364 days, you're eating around the same. So the average is, it's like, uh, it's like 30 calories, 20 calories extra per day, which is minuscule. I, I actually don't think it contributes to weight loss. The reason that video, though, was important is in the context of someone that is starting a aggressive weight loss journey, momentum, inertia, and progress matter the most to his mental confidence. And that's a whole different game. So I just wanted to to show off that even at the biggest risk, here's a way you can enjoy it, have fun, and not feel like you're missing out. So, yeah. So when you when you handhold people through this process and they're showing progress and they hit that set point, whatever it is, what are the techniques that you use to kind of break through whatever that set point is? Because I imagine it happens. I know, uh, at least for myself, you know, I can get to a certain place and, you know, it just gets like harder and harder to lose the next pound, you know, it just gets harder yeah. and harder. Like there's some thermostat that's right. playing in the background. Like, what do you use to kind of break through that? Well, you know, the first question, do you know your maintenance calories? Do you know how many calories you need to eat to maintain your current body weight? Uh, I've been told it's as high as 2,800, but I want to believe it should be lower. Like, I want to believe it should be more like 2,200. I actually do roughly count calories, and I often think in a given day, yeah. I'm well under a couple of thousand calories. Oh, wow. Now, maybe I'm just not um, accounting correctly for some of the stuff that I do. I don't know. I try to be pretty rigorous about it. You know, none of the apps really make it that easy, at least from what I've seen. It's not like right. you can take a picture of something and it, transforms yes. all the data yeah. we're not there from an there AI. is a company trying to do it and and one of my clients is an investor in that company right i laugh when i think of that idea because i know how complicated it could get but yeah. it'd be a huge benefit if so right but if let's say we were to work together and let and we were clear you were tracking it cal correctly right and you were to hit a plateau which they happen and i know because i live practice what i preach and i run into plateaus what oftentimes happens is you're under so much stress to the body because you're in a deficit for so long that just your body's fighting back, holding on in starvation mode. And so the most counterintuitive solution you would never believe is to actually take a what we call a diet break. And it's about two weeks long where you actually don't eat in a deficit. You eat at maintenance. You give your body exactly what it needs to maintain the weight. And one of two things happen when you do that. Either you just stay, the weight stays the same, and then we drop it back to the deficit after two weeks, give your body some rest, like you were just talking about. And then the weight starts falling off. Really? <laughs> or when you eat at maintenance, you start losing weight immediately. <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy that this body is this beautiful, beautiful system that, you know, when you think about that, we're starving it at the end of the day. Eventually, you know, when rubber hits the road, it's there's a too too far point, and we need to recover. See, and, I've never I've never heard that advice before. Did you just sort of figure that out from your own practice, or how did you? A combination you of me running into my own plateaus, me following some of the experts in the space that I aspire to uh, to be like, and mm -hmm. yeah, what they prescribed anecdotally. And what I've tried myself, I would literally lose a pound, 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 and then boom, it's flat and nothing's working. And I said, well, it doesn't hurt to eat at maintenance, right? I'm not going to gain weight. I'm just eating at maintenance. And then, yeah, it would, the weight would come off. Interesting.
Because right. I, I think a lot of people would find that counterintuitive where I thought you were going to go. And I've heard other people say, well, you just have to like bite the bullet and actually increase the fasting. And that could actually cause like exactly a lot of psychological pain, you know? Yep. I mean, when you watch what Hemsworth goes through, because there's a guy that does a lot of weightlifting every day. He does a lot of stuff to keep that physique that makes him so popular as Thor in the in the movies. Um, he's he's essentially going through hell by the time he hits about the 72nd hour, the three day mark. And that fourth day of of not eating anything, just drinking water is yeah. is like a form of torture. And then what they did in the film, which you'll get a kick out of, is he has to actually then hunt his meal. Yeah, and I won't describe in what which the movie the Thor movie. There's a movie. There's a movie that um, National Geographic made of Hemsworth. It's called something like um, Limitless, or I'll send you the link. Oh, to it. he has a he has a like dementia or some type of Alzheimer's high risk. Yes, that and, came out. That came out as a result of all the tests that Peter Attilia, the doctor, the MD from Stanford. Right. now has a practice in Austin, Texas, uh, that's very expensive. I think he charges like 90,000 a year and there's a waiting list. There's a waiting list of right. people that want to become, and I'm not even sure he calls them his patients. I think he calls them his clients because technically his view is it's not really the practice of medicine. It's more like this, what you do. It's mm. more like, like physiological training, diet, nutrition. I mean, you could call it, I suppose, to some degree, the practice of medicine, but he doesn't prescribe medication. He's not doing anything to sort of say, well, we got to put you on these vitamins. We got to do this. We got. He's just going through like nutrition, exercise, right? mental health, yoga, meditation. You know, he's going through all of these things with a view of, you know, we're going to make you the best person you can be, and then we're going to make you accountable. But I don't even think he spend the kind of time that you spend with your clients. I mean, well, literally, <laughs> I think he charges a lot of money. Uh, yeah. You know, people want him, and he's very selective. He only, according to the what's been revealed, right. only selects clients that have lots of followers on either Facebook or Instagram, like famous people. Sure. If you're a famous person, like he might take you, you don't need him, but he might take you because it's like, Hey, you got a big following on YouTube or you've got a big following on Instagram. I just need 90 grand liquid as well. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, maybe he'll give you the, maybe he'll give you the deal for free because in a way, if he were building a franchise model, he would need people like you. You're right. His and, disciples. And yeah. you would say, you know, I'm basically a Peter Atilia disciple. Now, I don't think he's gotten to that point yet. I think it's pretty yeah. much his own practice. And But he is getting rich and famous people to sort of say, yeah, I want to live to. And, and the way he does this, which is I wanted to get your comments on. He, his initial consultation is, hey, uh, what do you want to be able to do when you get to a hundred years old? Yes. You want to be able to like run a marathon? Cause that's a different set of training than, well, I want to be able to ride a bicycle for 10 miles, or I want to be able this. to walk or hike for two hours. It's a different, it's a different standard. You got to tell me what you want to do when you get to that point and we'll target a hundred, like he's using a hundred as well as kind of the benchmark. Some people are starting to use 110 like the super centenarian thing, which is amazing to me that they're going that far out. But conceptually there's billboards that are saying the person who's going to live in America to the age of 130 has already been born. I think metropolitan life has put that kind of billboard up that their wow. statistics suggest. They're not going to live in a city. I'll tell you that they're probably <laughs> living somewhere else. They're not seeing that billboard. They're well, like in the forest. It's, it's interesting because it's a society that, wants to see people live a long time, but at the same time, it's not really teaching quality of life over that right. life, man. I mean, it's amazing right. to me that we, we get into the whole money thing along with the whole lifespan thing without really looking at the quality of what's actually occurring over that period of time. But the point that I wanted to make about the film is that 
you know, he he goes on this regimen with Peter Attia, which which has other components. Like he was a big believer in uh, going into a sweat shack, you know, going into kind of a sweat lodge, like once a week, maybe a, a sauna, but basically right. something that gets up to like 160 degrees or something, mm. really high number. And he claims that kind of pounding the body with a lot of heat and then maybe dipping into kind of a cold plunge, like this extreme uh, will actually create a, a repair cycle that will will make you stronger. Like what doesn't kill you makes you stronger kind of idea. Right. Well, we're going to like push the limits of that. And they go through that together, both him and Hemsworth go through that process of pushing the limits of what they can do. I'll send you the link because I think you'll I love that. watch it and you'll be like, yeah, the, these, these, fo I mean, it's amazing because in a lot of ways, there's so many different components to it. I don't know whether, uh, Hemsworth ultimately, uh, improved his overall health because he gets the jolt as a result of this, that look, your APOBE numbers, which are, you know, a marker, a biological marker are really bad. And you're 10 times more likely to have Alzheimer's. Yeah. I mean, that like is like a that took the headlines. That was everywhere. Yeah, um, that was like a, a, a kick below the belt because everything else sounds like I'm going to help you get to 100. But I've got a piece of bad news for you. And then he does a podcast with him about after he revealed that news. I'll send you that link too. Right. Where he says, uh, so you know, what were you thinking at the time I told you that? And Hemsworth, I won't wow. destroy the punchline, but Hemsworth goes through kind of his thought process about how did he think about it and so on. So it's a really interesting uh, story of a guy who's so strong. Now the worry is kind of his brain span. So it's yeah. not about lifespan. It's not about health span. It's about brain span. Yeah. And it's like, hey, I want my brain to actually be able to operate you know, maybe I'll lose mobility, but hey, if I at least have my brain, that that's something to preserve. I mean, on a scale, it's like for some people, if they don't have their brain, they'd rather be dead, even if they could run a marathon, right? Right, right. I mean, interesting. But, but at the same time, I might argue that we live in such a surface level vain society that I think people are making decisions every day that say their, their actions say otherwise. I think people say they value their brain, but then... People are drinking alcohol all the time, and we know really what like, alcohol does really, to the brain. Which is really like a bullet. Some people argue it's like it's, putting a bullet to your head. Right. right. So do you really value your brain? And people could say it's normalized, and normalized doesn't mean that it doesn't damage your brain. <laughs> are you willing to look? Are you willing to see and really dive deep into what you're doing to hurt your, your mind and your brain? No one's getting sleep. Right. This is a sleep deprived community where we're coffee and uh, caffeinated completely. We're all about output and money. I wouldn't say many people care about their brains, Jack. Right. I think people would rather have a pill that gets them ripped before they actually take a deep look at their health. And what I love about the journey is I'm willing to meet people there thinking they want the pill. But I know that over time, just like the meal prep, they will then be inspired to say, maybe I could do the next step. Maybe I can do the next step. And eventually they'll find out I'll drop 90 K to get my, to get my brain scan. Well, what, what, what's the typical duration of the consulting that you do? I mean, I imagine for some people that have a long journey, it could be years. Of course, of course. I imagine for other people, it might be as wide, as short as a couple of months. Like what, what do you find happens for people when they finally get to their goals? So they say, thank you very much. It's been nice knowing you or they stay connected or what, what actually typically happens? The shortest I'll do, um, is a 12 month program, okay. 12, 12 week program, 12 week. Okay. 12 week, three months, 90 days. And that's just enough time where you're committed, you make the investment. And at the end of three months, when we work together, you can see the difference, your community sees the difference, and you're probably a whole wardrobe size smaller. But the thing about health is I'm on the same health path, right? I got my own health coaches, and I got many of them. So 
it's not that it ends and they normally say goodbye. Oftentimes it's what's next. And either it is let's go further in the current direction or now you've arrived. What's next? Which, you know, you you got to this great, amazing physique. And for instance, one person I work with, they didn't even realize their body looked this good underneath all this fat. That then the next thing is, I want to now build muscle. I want to really build it. So it's just a new chapter. And then sometimes we get into sleep. Sometimes we get into, you know, brain health and energy. I mean, as long as I'm on this journey, I know that there's more to be had, right? Once I retire from health, then my clients will too. Well, what do you what what are you gonna do when Hollywood fetches you and puts you into the movies because you're a good looking guy? And they're gonna, you're gonna have a following, and some Hollywood agent's gonna call you and say, "Iman, I've got the perfect role for you. You're gonna be playing with Danny DeVito, and you're gonna take DeVito on this transformation. And yeah. DeVito's getting older, and he's getting fatter. Of course, almost yeah. everyone in Hollywood. Well, everyone's getting older. I think pretty much all the older people in Hollywood are getting fatter. I mean, you go across the right. board, all these right. beautiful people are like becoming different people over time. I mean, Jack Nicholson used to be a good looking, relatively thin guy. And I don't know. Yes. Is he still, yes. I think he's still alive. He's right? still alive and he's still courtside Lakers drinking beers every day. Right. Okay, so, Talk about brain health. Right. Right. <laughs> but I, the last time I saw a picture of him, you know, my mom, she died last year, bless her soul. She used to get the national Enquirer, So I, I used to read, I used to flip through it when, when I was with her, it would flip through it. And I would be like, God, what happened to these people? She loved it. She loved at the age of 90, she loved looking at that person was such a gorgeous woman. I can't believe what's happened to her, you know, because over time people often let themselves go, particularly right. when they get to a point of, of retirement, they kind of lose it. They kind of lose any real sense of purpose. But I imagine that you, you're going to get plucked out by some agent who's going to find you and say, hey, I got to put you in this movie. You, you're well, the perfect person. Well, what's so funny is, what's the name of the person that worked with Chris Hemsworth? That person yeah. we've been talking about? Yeah, Chris Hemsworth, yeah. But who is the specialist that oh, we've been Peter, talking about? I'm going to send you his his website, Peter Atia. It's Peter, Peter Atia. Atia N.D. A T T I T I A M D. I think that's it. dot com. This should open up to the right. Got it. Peter Atia. I may have misspelled it, but you'll find it. It's Peter Atia. Atia. Yeah. So just like Peter, I think if we want to change the culture of health and how people see it in this era, we got to get on a bigger stage. We got to get on a bigger platform. And I, I really. I really resonate with the idea that he's selective and it's not to say that others don't deserve health. I definitely plan on working on more affordable options uh, for people, but my own goal is to get on the big platforms, whether it be Hollywood or my 12 month goal is to be the YouTube transformation coach where I'm getting the biggest YouTubers in amazing shape and to do it on a platform where it's predominantly a younger audience is Absolutely, I think the first path to creating a whole new culture in 10 years time where we're seeing health more openly. We are like you're talking medicine is moving away from the model of repair to empowering people. Right. I think health is the same thing. And I think being selective and moving up toward people with more influence is the way to do it. That's that's how you do it. So well, that when people look at those transformations and they ask how and why, hopefully I have a bunch of stories and I do capture it like a documentary. Like, here's actually what happened behind the scenes. And you don't care about Joe Schmo's transformation, but I bet you care about Liam Hemsworth's. So I'm going to tell the same story on a platform you're at least most people are willing to listen to. So the the show, just I just found it. I'm going to send you the link for it. The show is called uh, Limitless with Peter Hemsworth and there's a trailer I'll, I'll put in the chat here so that you have it because I think this is absolutely um, instructive to everything we've talked about. And it's, oh, it's is relevant. Perfect. It's relevant to this whole story of even Hemsworth thought he could improve, which a lot of people would look at him 
and say, man, you're at the 99.99% point in your life. Really? You can improve. Right. And, and they prove he can and, and did, and they do it and they go through the metrics of it. And it's really an interesting process to watch. So it says a lot right. about how, you know, the human body can be transformed even when it doesn't look like it needs transformation. There right. can be transformation. Uh, because there are not a lot of knowledge workers in the orbit that I work in that want to know, well, who are the people that do this stuff and yeah. how can they help me? And you're, you're, you're like one of a kind. I mean, you are, you are someone that's transformed yourself and now are bringing that transformation to others in yeah. a very successful and manageable way. So I applaud you in a huge I way. I really appreciate it. And it's such an honor to be here, uh, having the time to talk with you here. And I appreciate the questions. They're very insightful and I'm always happy to make it. And with your permission, of course, I'd love to send this to your parents and, and get their input on it because I know they're very proud of you. And I know that yeah. they, I know that they told me when you moved to Los Angeles that they were a little shocked that right. you decided to give up everything you gave up. And I said, I remember at the time I said, you know what? He's being an entrepreneur and you should applaud that because that's in your DNA. That's who you are. And that's in your family's DNA. And he's just taking it to the next level. So you should applaud it. And I'm glad I'm here to applaud it as well, because you are an entrepreneur and you come from an entrepreneurial family. And I don't think you have anything to worry about. I think you're going to do and are doing very well. And you've already helped so many people. So that proves the point. Thank you so much, Jack. And of course, the minute I see a, a recording as a fellow YouTuber, I'm I'm ready. You know, okay. like you send it to whoever you need to. Okay. It's all about spreading the message, whether okay, it's mom good. and dad or others. Good. Yeah. Okay. Have a good night. Talk to you later. Okay. Bye-bye. Tune in next time on The Valley Current.